the hands off. So for properly, welcome. This is Cynthia Diane Haney of Cynthia Wood Spinner. I am a spindle maker and a spinning instructor. And today I am going to teach you how to ply yarn on a top whorl drop spindle. This is one of the top whorl drop spindles I make in that the whorl is at the top of the spindle shaft. It has a hook that the yarn is going to be hanging from as we spin it. I notch all my spindles uh, to guide the yarn to the hook, and you'll see why that matters shortly. Then also, uh, this happens to be one I've made in a black walnut with a really spectacular patch of sapwood on the side on a curly ash shaft, and that's uh, that's A-S-H, ash, the wood. Um, sometimes that's a hard one to pronounce if you're not tripping over your tongue on video. And that is the wood uh, for the spindle that we're spinning. It is in my trunk size, which is my largest size, which is very well suited to plying most yarns. And it weighs almost three ounces. So it's got lots of momentum for what we're doing. And the plying we're doing today is going to be making a two ply yarn from one single. So I had spun this yarn up. It's uh, from a bat uh, called Emerald River by Sweet Tree Hill Farm, a uh, local uh, farm to me. Well, local in that it's less than a two-hour drive, which when you live in the country, that's local. Um, and it's mohair and Shetland blended together. And so I spun this on one of my branch size spindles, the, the mid-size, uh, during um, Fiber World online activity uh, recently. And afterwards, I wound that one strand of yarn onto my Nostapine, another tool I make. This one's in Sycamore. By tying an end here, and I wound, and I do have Nostapine video uh, here on the YouTube channel, so I'm not getting into how to wind, which means we have access to both ends of the yarn. So we're going to take these two ends and put them together back on the spindle in the opposite direction and get our two-ply yarn. So to get started, I'm going to untie the end that's here on the nostapine that's gonna be coming from the center. So center ends acquired, outside ends acquired. Outside ends a little um, thicker and fuzzier because that's the very beginning where I started spinning on the spindle and the very end of the other, uh, could actually use just one smidgen more twist because that was the, the very fluffy end and I wasn't certain if I was gonna to join to it or not. Now, depending on your tangle comfort level and the nature of the yarn you're using. You may want to just slide this up the Nostapine and carefully work straight from the Nostapine. That can get awkward, but it does keep something in the center of the ball so you don't have a total collapse and tangles. I was very careful to have rested the singles on the spindle overnight before I wound this ball, and you can actually see through the hole when I pulled the Nostapine out, I was very careful in the winding on the Nostapine to not have it under tension, just enough that it didn't pigtail on itself, but not under tension. So as you see, I've got a nice crisp pull. You can actually see my cross through it uh, where the Nostapine had been. So this is going to feed nicely for us. So I'm going to back up. Well, I'm going to get this attached to the spindle and I'm back up. So for the moment, I'm just setting this on ta the table out of view. The two ends we're going to tie together, just a simple little knot, and we're going to use that to hang it on the spindle. And so the two singles on the spindle, I've got the center pull ball in my hand. I'm backing up so you can actually see what I'm doing. Backing up some more, there we go. So now these singles were spun clockwise, which means we need to spin counterclockwise, which I achieved by having the spindle in my left hand and I'm just flicking thumb out, fingers in. And then as it spins, and I'm gonna have to stand up too, um, I'm just feeding more yarn out from the ball, making sure, and whoops, we're gonna be dexterous here, making sure that I don't let snarls like the one that's trying to form here, that over the wall so you can see better, uh, end up in my yarn. And I also got enough yarn made so far that I can get that all. The most tricky part of this the first time is getting hold of everything so you can get it off the hook of the spindle and wind it on the spindle shaft. I'm actually just gonna set the ball in my lap. This is stable enough. It's not gonna run away too bad. And we're gonna wind tightly over the end on the spindle shaft tightly 
or aiming it tightly right now, it's still dancing around, there we go, uh, to get established on the shaft of the spindle. And in a moment, we will be taking advantage of the notch. And if you have a desire, if you're listening live to leave me a comment, you're welcome to if you've applied yarn before, uh, if you use a spindle, anything like that. So now that I have gotten that up to the hook, uh, as always, sometimes you have snake tangles. And this is a case that the tangle actually came from the outside of the ball feeding too easily um, into my hand. And so we're just gonna need to back that up until it's smoothed out. Make sure you're still in the hook of the spindle and get a grip on the ball so it's not ending up with more coming out getting tangled. And again, counterclockwise, I flicked in the middle of the spindle shaft so it's wobbling. It doesn't normally wobble. Get that part taken care of. Again, wind on the spindle shaft over itself firmly. We're not quite firm enough yet, so that's um, had been slipping around a little bit, but it'll behave soon. Come back, notch, hook, and now we're going to feed out some more. I'm actually going to do a brief bit of park and draft, parking the spindle under my arm just so that we can manage the tangle. Tangles always happen on camera, but they're a good illustration of what really happens in real life. This is not the only method I use to make a two-ply yarn, but this is the method I had ready to show you today, and I had not showed on video very much, so it's the one we're seeing. And so now, comfortable reach. Uh, now, be careful in person of waving your arms above your shoulders. I'm just being acrobatic to stay on camera as much as possible for you. And as you see, we've wound firmly over itself so it's not sliding around so much as we establish the cop, the name for the spun yarn on the spindle. So we're gonna feed out a little bit more to get it started well. And bringing the second hand up once you set the spindle in motion, I'm gonna stand up again so you can see, um, allows me to keep a finger between the strands as I'm unwinding this all from the ball and have it behave well. Normally I would butterfly this up my hand to grab it better, but I'm just waving my arms around a little bit inappropriately in that I'm showing you bad habits of waving your arms around above your shoulder, not that there's anything wrong with that, other than you'll get sore if you do it too much. So we're just gonna keep spinning and I'm trying to make sure that the essential bits are staying on camera enough and you can, if need be, and I'll show up the next make here, you could, if you're not comfortable with the spindle spinning as you're making the yarn, you could do this entirely park and draft if need be, which would mean you'd leave yourself a lead or some amount of yarn between what you're feeding into the twist and the hook. You'd go ahead and set the spindle in motion, but not try and make any yarn while it's spinning and catch it when it stops. And you see how that's super springy, super, super densely plied at the moment, much more so than we want. Then you can park the spindle under your arm or between your knees, and you can feed yarn out of your bowl, ball, not bowl, let's mix up words today, into the twist until it looks more like a normal plied yarn. Now you do need to keep an eye that you don't under ply your yarn, but that's that's about a good plying twist there. And then wind onto the shaft and you could repeat leaving a leader again. However, plying is a wonderful opportunity to get the hang of spinning suspended when the spindle's moving as you're making yarn because it's not gonna drop on you unless it comes out of the hook since it's being held up by two strands of existing yarn. And that means that you can get the hang of things. And even if you accidentally, even if you accidentally let it stop without catching it, it's not the end of the world. You'd lose some plying twist, but it's still wet and drop on the floor. So it gives you an opportunity to get the hang of handling it. Of course, you are going the opposite direction from the way you normally spin. So there is some difference in how you're moving. Uh, in setting it in motion, but it does allow you to get an idea for the properties involved here. And plying on a spindle that's rim weighted, and that refers to the way I've shaped my whorl in that there is more wood away from the spindle shaft than up close to it. And I'm doing a wacky butterfly that includes the ball of yarn to get there. See, 
the whorl is hollowed kind of like a bowl and that makes it room weighted. And that's why the spindle is spinning such a nice long amount of time for setting it in motion, uh, for the same effort as setting it in motion. And as a result, I'm not finding a need to do a thigh roll because I have a strong finger flick. However, if you're not getting your spindle to spin long enough, or if you need it to spin a little bit faster, you can, making sure you leave a bit of a leader first, you can do a thigh roll and that you'd come up the thigh, release the spindle, and I released it a little wildly, so it's gonna wobble a little, but it'll settle down if I leave it on camera so you can see it settle down and get it spinning that way. And catch it when it stops. And keep winding on. I very much prefer this cop shape of, as in the wound yarn, yarn, let's really be tongue tied today. The yarn wound on the spindle shaft, the COP, C-O-P, I prefer to shape it in a oval so that it is tidier and works better, particularly if I'm flying a large skein of yarn and I need to get more on the spindle, particularly if I'm getting to the point that the amount of yarn on the spindle is as wide or nearly as wide as the spindle's whorl. Uh, with an oval shape, you could even have your yarn wider uh, than the spindle's whorl. But this amount of yarn is not going to end up filling the spindle enough to be a worry. So we're just going to keep plying. Like I say, feel free to leave something in the chat if you want while you're live. And I will reply. And I'm attempting to keep the spindle on camera. Of course, I'm waving all over the place in the process. And I probably should have backed up even further. And if I'm smart, I'll just move the chair out of the way so I can back up further. Although at some point I'll walk into the wall, but that's no big deal. So just plying and plying. Plying is fast. Plying is relaxing. You're not having to think about drafting. You're just needing to make sure you keep feeding your two strands evenly into the ball, into the twist, from the ball into the twist, and that you're putting a consistent amount of twist uh, with the plying in. And like anything, don't change directions midway through because then you get a very different result of an overspun two singles together instead of uh, an actual plied yarn. Uh, and how much twist you put in and plying is really a personal preference kind of thing and what you're wanting to do with the yarn. I'm aiming for a reasonably balanced yarn that will probably get knit or crocheted with eventually. Uh, I have more of these bats that I've not used yet, so I don't know quite exactly what I will be doing with it as a finished project because this is a first step of a bigger amount. So I think I have four ounces or maybe even five ounces worth of these bats, and I think this was about one ounce. So as far, that's an important thing to talk about though, as far as how much yarn you can put on a spindle while plying, it is all a matter of what the spindle can handle and what your body can handle. Be careful if you're putting a large amount, as in a lot of yardage, a lot of weight and hand spun really matters more than yardage um, on the spindle because that weight, which increases the more yarn we put on the spindle, uh, is hanging from your hands and your wrists and you do not want to develop uh, problems with your muscles uh, and so forth. So be aware of how heavy your spindle is plus how heavy your applied skein is becoming. And sometimes it's better to have two skeins than to have too much weight waving off your arms because once we're all done, the next step will be to wind this on a nitty knotty to uh, make the skein of yarn and that you know, to get it in the long loops and skeins. And that's a different video that I've already done. But you are still holding the spindle as you're winding it on the knitting knotty. And then that same weight of the yarn transfers to the knitting knotty. So the bottom line is the heavier you make this based on how much yarn you put on it, the more weight you're bearing, which can be good exercise if you're using good body mechanics, but just something to think about. And I went on just a little bit too much. Come back there. Uh, so what does that mean practically? I have plied a six ounce skein. It wasn't really on purpose. I just was stubborn. <laughs> that was a bit too much for me. It was on probably a two and a quarter ounce spindle. My favorite plying spindle is the first one I ever made, uh, which is two and a quarter ounces. Uh, 
my average skein is pretty close to four ounces, not just because it fits very comfortably on the spindle for plying, not just because it's a not so mean, but still significant amount of weight hanging up my hands, but also because many of the fibers I spin come in four ounce quantities. So if I'm say making a two ply, I have four ounces worth of fiber, you know, split in two, that's then, you know, two ounces per ply. Um, to use up and then I'm out of yarn that matches. So it's a convenient amount to do. Uh, but for sampling, I will do as little as just like a yard or two, which isn't even worth weighing um, to spin. And I had spun more from this bat than I realized. But I love plying uh, when I get to be at like in-person spinning guild or group uh, meetings because I can wander around and have my plying and be talking to people and every most everybody else is trapped at their spinning wheels. And I'm like, yeah, I get to come over and visit with you and then go over and talk to somebody else. And they're all stuck behind their wheels or if they're up socializing, they're not getting any spinning done. Whereas I get to socialize and spin and not just with the person that's sitting next to me. Although sometimes I will hold still and spin. It depends on what I'm making. Um, so. But uh, as far as other things to talk about, since we've got a bit more plying to go and, you know, it's nice to have something to listen to, I've been spindle making and spinning for 10 years now. I have recently signed my 479th spindle and I have eight more from my current batch in the workshop waiting for, they look like spindles now, but they're don't have notches and hooks and no finish on them yet, uh, ready to go. I truly love making spindles, but I also make the nastapines, nitty knotties, crochet hooks, yarn bowls, uh, and so forth. And even more than the making of the tools, I love teaching people how to use them. So I have been offering classes both virtually and in person. And I do have some classes coming up, knowing that this part of the video is not the part I cropped off at the beginning or will shortly. Um, I'm not going to specify exactly which events and dates. Uh, they are all on my website, CynthiaWoodSpender.com. And if you'd like me to give a class for your festival or group meeting or anything like that, uh, or your yarn shop or whatever, just let me know. Um, I do travel. Um, within reason <laughs> and some compensation depending on the nature and duration distance of that. Um, but I, I love sharing my passion for spinning with other people and we're flying away. And as you see, this ball is getting smaller in my hand. The advantage of plying from a center pole ball, obviously, whoops, you really shouldn't stretch that far because it gets hard to catch the spindle. That's why I prefer to butterfly it up my hand. Um, the advantage of plying from a center pole ball of yarn like this is that the outside's getting smaller at the same time as the inside's getting bigger. So it doesn't end up quite as untidy as if you're say knitting or crocheting with it and have the uh, center just getting more and more open and the outside starts falling apart. The disadvantage of this, which may or may not become apparent as we get near the end, is that it's entirely possible for the inside to kind of collapse due to, you know, it's getting bigger and we're pulling on it and the yarn, you know, had active twist. And so it wants to, to do things in a non-tidy and orderly manner. It wants to try and ply up on itself or on anything it can get a hold of. And as a result, it's quite possible to end up with a bit of a tangled mess at the end. It's not a bad, you know, permanent stuck kind of oh no tangle, but it is a little bit tricky at the end, which is why I'm trying to make sure to get to the end of this plying so you see all of it, um, which I know makes the video a little longer. So if you're impatient for the end, just skip forward a little bit. We're getting there. Of course, while we're live, you can't skip forward. But after we're live, um, yeah, my family asked, well, how long do we need to be quiet today? And I was like, well, till I finish flying, however long that's going to take. <laughs> Speaking of how long it takes to spin a quantity, as again, we're looking for something to talk about while I'm spinning, I typically, if I'm at a festival demonstrating 
uh, and talking to people and stopping to sell stuff and so forth, will spend a minimum of two ounces worth of fiber in a day. I will spend more like three, three and a half in a day if I don't have as many responsibilities or interruptions. Well, interruptions to the spinning, not that there's ever a true interruption to festival. I'm there to talk to people. Uh, at home, though, I only spend for about an hour each night because then I spend the other hour trying to use up some of the yarn I've made of uh, my little evening downtime. And at home, uh, spinning in the evenings, I am sitting in my recliner with my feet up, which means I have to wind on more often because there's not room to let the spindle get down to the floor, which it would be rather jarring to get the camera tipped so you could see the spindle, but the spindle's getting very close to thunking its into the shaft on the floor uh, as I'm making more. So that gives you an idea of how that goes. So if I were to say spin uh, two ounces of fiber one day at a festival and two ounces of fiber another day at a festival to then apply it together, if I do it at a group meeting, I'll have it done in an afternoon or less. If I do it at home, it'll take me most of a week maybe because uh, I rarely am doing just one spinning project at once so that's a harder thing to measure. I find it's a little bit harder to keep your tension on the wind on of the cock on the spindle shaft as tight when plying as when spinning singles partly because the plying the act of plying is not just that the yarn is becoming twice as thick as the individual strand was it's also trapping some air in there and getting um you know, fluffier and, and a larger diameter than just the, the double. And as a result, that fluffiness makes it a little bit hard to get it quite as firmly wound on the spindle shaft. So you got to be careful that it doesn't start slopping about. And so as you see, we're starting to get to the point where it's being a little bit harder to feed out uh, from the ball because the ball doesn't look much like a ball anymore. But I'm just making sure that I'm feeding those two strands evenly to the spindle. And I am doing um, some butterfly more often now of walking the yarn up my thumb and pinky to get it to my hand um, so I can wind on the spindle easier. And I'm very much making sure that I'm kind of manipulating the ball and encouraging it to feed out. I'm also having to be somewhat careful not to put too much plying twist in because it's being a little bit slower and feeding out as it gets a little bit more unwieldy of that. So, feed out, feed out. There we go. We've got some. Let's get some plying. Get some more. We're getting near the end. I do appreciate you watching with me live. It's nice not feeling like I'm talking to myself, and I love making videos live because, well, yes, I do occasionally trip over my tongue, and I apologize for that earlier. It allows me to get a video made and made reasonably well and up and ready for you to watch without the hours of, oh, did that look right on? And did I stay on camera? And as you see, I need to go back and retrieve because the center of the ball is not feeding as fast as outside there. So I had to go make sure they two were together before I came on. But basically, I can get you more videos in a more timely manner by doing them live than I can doing uh, pre-recorded things because the editing and the, you know, live has this wonderful thing of I can see myself on camera, which is great. So I know, yes, I'm on camera because I don't do things with a, a videographer. I'm, it's always me. <laughs> I make the spindles. Every single step of every single part of every spindle involves at least one, if not both of my hands actively engaged in the work. And same with all my other tools. Um, you know, I make my own website. I do my own shipping and Every step involved in all this is, is all me. I'm a one, one, one woman operation, but that way I'm able to ensure exactly the quality that I demand for my tools. And I need just one little bit more twist and we are at the end. Did you see the end one continuous loop? Make sure that got the last of the twist it needed. Just a little bit more and there we're done. Now, I would uh, probably let this rest. It does a little bit easier if it does, but it's not as essential as with a single. And then would wind it into a skein on the Nitty Knotty next. And you can watch one of the other videos that already covers how to do things on the Nitty Knotty. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the how to apply yarn on the drop spindle, starting with a center pole ball made on an ostopene.
and I hope you have a great day. Please uh, subscribe to see more of my videos and check out my CynthiaWoodspinner.com website to be able to check up on classes and other videos and festivals and see the tools so that you can buy them if you want. So thank you.